I think social distancing will become a little bit of a social norm for some time to come. You must stay at home. Whatever it takes, we will beat the coronavirus and we will beat it together. The coronavirus crisis and the ensuing lockdown has changed Britain dramatically in what has been a very unnerving few weeks. But will this crisis be over as quickly as it begun or are we going to be battling this outbreak for years to come. Well, Dr. Hillary is here. He'll be answering your questions in just a moment. But first, Hillary, what do you think about the British recovery from this? Because it feels like, sadly, it's not going to be over anytime soon. No, it can't be, unfortunately. It arrived very quickly. This is a virus that transmits very easily. It's very contagious. Um, it's quite virulent uh, for many people uh, and we only have to look at the stats to see how it's ravaged um, uh, much of the community and is putting the NHS under great strain. Now, the virus isn't going to go away nearly as quickly as it arrived. Um, it's going to linger. It's going to be passed from person to person after lockdown, which inevitably has to be eased at some point. And, and then we'll have more people mingling together again. We'll see a little bit of a resurgence of the virus even after this current peak has passed. And the virus will continue to circulate, not just in our community, but in other countries around the world for some months to come. That is the, uh, the way it's going to be, I'm afraid. And we just have to accept that uh, the herd immunity in various countries will take a time to develop. And hopefully, as quickly as possible, Brilliant scientists will find uh, a vaccine which is effective and safe and can be given to as many people as possible. So what measures, as in these draconian restrictions, Dr Hillary, do you expect to still be in place in months to come? Well, certainly we want to avoid mass gatherings. Um, it, it's absolute common sense and, and, and logic that if you have thousands of people all pressed together at a sporting event or an entertainment event um, such as a concert, you're likely to get further spread of the virus passed on to people who haven't been exposed to it and who aren't immune. And we would then get a resurgence of cases and we'd be back to square one. So it makes absolutely absolute sense that we, we wouldn't be condoning those sort of gatherings uh, any time soon. Um, to a lesser extent, however, um, there's a case for allowing some people to go back to work in a phased way so that the, it minimises exposure to as many people as possible and it allows the NHS to cope. So there will be easements, if you like, but they'll be gradual. What about in six months time? Well, we have to wait and see what the figures show. We have to see how the virus behaves, how social distancing is working, um, how perhaps a return to school uh, for school children uh, affects the prevalence of the virus and the effect of the virus. We just have to wait and see. I mean, I know that people's mindset is I'd like to plan a holiday in you know, two months from now, three months from yes. now, I'd like to I'd like to travel to see my relatives in yeah. wherever. New Zealand in my case. We, we all like to make plans, but we just can't at the moment until no. we know where we are. OK, OK, let me try one more. What about a year, Hillary? What about a year? What will still be in place in a year's time? Well, in a year, I, I think uh, what we would hope is that we've had a, an ease uh, in uh, lockdown measures that people are largely back to work, that we're seeing l less cases of uh, severe virus infection in the community, uh, an NHS which is restaffed by the people who've come back to work in it and they're coping really, really well. We've got enough ventilators to treat people who become severely ill and life hopefully will be getting back to normal. Um, a year from now, we still might not have a vaccine, but we would hopefully begin to see one on the horizon. And 18 months from now, then certainly in terms of health, I would like to see things more or less back to normal. But I think the economy will take a bit longer than that because just some people have suffered so badly. So many amazing questions coming in from you on the hashtag AskDrHillary. Let's go first to Margaret Ferrand, who asks the majority of us are following the government advice, yet the deaths and infections are still increasing. When do you think we will see a slowdown in the virus's spread? 
we're not seeing an exponential rise in uh, deaths at the moment. So in other words, it's not doing that. It's slowing down. It's still rising, but it's slowing down. And the reason it's slowing down, and that's good news, is because lockdown is beginning to work. You have to remember that when we went into lockdown three weeks ago, some people um, people were still going to gatherings like the Cheltenham Festival and concerts uh, uh, around the around the world and the virus was spreading rapidly. So people went into lockdown then. We try to suppress the virus transmission, um, but it takes time for the virus to uh, show itself. And so there's an incubation period. And if people are in self-isolation, when one person in the household develops symptoms, then everyone's uh, in self-isolation for 14 days. But if someone else in the household then develops symptoms, say 11 days later, they still have to self-isolate for a further 14 days. So it's beginning to work now. We're seeing a slowing down of the number of uh, cases coming into hospital and a, and a fewer uh, number of deaths. But it's going to be a peak perhaps in a, a week's time, two weeks time. Then it'll plateau for another two or three weeks. And then hopefully we'll start to see numbers decrease. That is the hope. Sue Moore asks, how long will it take to be completely safe not to observe the two metre social distance rule? I think it'll take some time because, as I've said, the virus will continue to circulate around the world for some time. What's happening here in the UK now is bad enough. But, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to think what might happen in countries where there is a, a denser population with very poor healthcare systems. I'm talking about parts of Asia. I'm talking about India, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where there's malnutrition and, and there's poor housing and overcrowding. You know, this virus could sweep through those countries and be absolutely devastating, more so than in the UK and other parts of Europe. Uh, and, you know, that virus will continue to circulate. Some people will not be immune in the UK, um, uh, but will still see cases, sporadic cases. So it's going to take some time before we can all say we can hug each other, we can embrace each other. I think social distancing will become a little bit of a social norm for some time to come, possibly two years. I think you are right, but I think it's going to be very interesting in our major cities because, for example, if you're packed into the tube in London like sardines, there's simply no opportunity to social distance. So perhaps the psychology of people is if we're doing it there, we might as well do it in the rest of our life. Whereas if you're in Cornwall or Devon or, or live a quieter life out in the country, there might be more opportunity to social distance. But it is a fascinating question. Thank you so much for it, Sue Moore. Let's go now to Carol Brown. Morning, Dr. Hillary. My question is, if you die with the coronavirus, does the virus die with you? If so, how long does it last after the person has died? If somebody loses their life uh, from COVID-19, then we know that the virus can persist for several days in the body. So that's why funeral directors who have been clamouring for enough PPE are doing a sterling job in making sure that they protect themselves and that uh, measures are put in place to make sure that relatives aren't exposed to the virus. So be very careful around the dead body at the moment. Uh, Tony Fernandez asks, is it safe to eat delivered restaurant food? Yes, if the food has been prepared uh, well, um, it's uh, presumably been cooked thoroughly, then the virus will be killed off by uh, cooking of the food. Um, now, the packaging is a different story. You don't know who's touched the packaging, who's done the delivery. So you take the food out of the packaging. Uh, you might want to reheat it. Um, you, you certainly want to be able to trust the restaurant if, it, if it's a salad or it's cold food. You want to make sure it's been thoroughly washed and, and uh, prepared by somebody wearing gloves, new gloves. Um, uh, and that's about all we can ask to do. Uh, it's important to wash your hands uh, before eating and uh, when you finished. Um, but hopefully if the, if the food's been cooked thoroughly, uh, it should be absolutely fine. Gillian Bavesta says, is there a common denominator between people dying and people surviving? How can an elderly person live and a child die who are both not in a vulnerable group? There's 
a lot that needs to be discovered about this particular virus and why it is so virulent and dangerous in some individuals and relatively harmless in others. Part of it, we think, is due to um, genetics, uh, and we have to explore that. That's really important. Um, part of it is the viral load that we're exposed to in the first instance. And we think that's one of the reasons why people working in critical care and intensive care are particularly vulnerable, because they're exposed to a lot of virus all at once. The other thing is something called antibody dependent enhancement, ADE. And it's thought that because this particular coronavirus belongs to a family of coronaviruses that cause things like common colds, that if you've got certain antibodies already to that family of coronaviruses, that something in your immune system overreacts to this particular coronavirus, COVID-19, and uh, makes you suffer more intensely than other people. So we need to look at all those things. We need to look at genetics. We need to look at antibodies that already exist. We need to look at viral load. And hopefully, quite soon, we'll know why some people are more vulnerable so that we can protect them more than the others who aren't so vulnerable. Next question from Clive Pinnell. Hi, Dr. Hillary. I just wondered if Sweden's approach to dealing with coronavirus is wrong, why is their death rate per capita still lower than ours, despite them not implementing harsh lockdown measures? Thank you. Well, Sweden are quite concerned at the moment that they're, they're scratching their heads and thinking maybe their policy was wrong in the first place. Very liberal in what they did. They, they had what they called an intelligent lockdown. Um, they allow people still to go to restaurants and bars and to socialise. And now they're beginning to see a rise in cases, nearly a thousand in Sweden. And you have to remember that the Swedish population are, is much less than ours. Um, so it may be that they regret not having a fuller lockdown earlier on. We have to wait and see. And I think, you know, we will look back and see which countries did it better. But we're all discovering what was the best thing to do and still is the best thing to do. And, and uh, it's only in retrospect that we'll discover who got it right. Of course, because remember, there's a great economic cost, which then has a major cost to lives and health in months to come and for example Dr Hillary Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand who has been so praised for doing this very harsh lockdown very early I have some questions about it because it means there's not going to be any degree of herd immunity amongst New Zealand citizens. Exactly um, and so there's always a downside I don't think there's any any one policy which is exactly right, there's always going to be some casualties, uh, some collateral damage, whatever you do, either to the economy or to the health of the nation. Personally, as a doctor, and I probably would think this way, uh, is that the health of people is more important than how much money they've got in their pockets. And the, the economy will recover uh, somehow or another. Down the line, the economy will recover. Um, there will be hardship, of course, um, and, and poverty, of course, for a while. But, um, you know, I, I don't think governments will be forgiven if they allow too many people to die no. all at and, once and I or for a health system that. like the NHS Just to collapse. So I, that is my priority. I and agree hopefully with that's that. the government's priority. But it was interesting reading that Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, this is according to Fraser Nelson in the Daily Telegraph, is concerned that, for example, a lot of people in lockdown aren't going to hospital for suspected heart attacks, aren't reporting lumps that they've potentially had. So I guess there definitely has to be a way to get the country back for our health, not just economically, but physically and psychologically. But thank you so much for your questions today. Thank you, Dr. Hillary. Of course, Hills will be back answering so many more of your questions tomorrow here on The Sun's YouTube page and also on my talk radio drive time show between four and seven. So we'd love to get your questions. All you need to do is go to thesun.co.uk forward slash Dr. Hillary. Or you can go to Talk Radio's uh, website, talkradio.co.uk. But also, we love getting your video questions. So if you want to send in a video question to Dr. Hillary and get it played out, then all you need to do is post it on social media using the hashtag AskDrHillary. But for now, thank you so much, Hillary. Have a great day, and we'll talk again tomorrow. And you, Dan. Cheers.